I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to this first session of a two-day online conference organized by the Institute of Palestine Studies uh, on the topic of the Jerusalem uprising, implications and consequences. Today we have a panel of three speakers, uh, each of whom will be speaking for about 20 to 25 minutes, followed by a period of uh, dedicated to questions from, from the online audience. And uh, you can submit your written questions either via Facebook or via the question and answer option on Zoom. And we will uh, then try to convey them to the speakers. So I hope we'll have uh, some time to uh, engage the audience and, and listen to your views and your responses to what the speakers are saying. So it's, it's my pleasure and great honor to be chairing this panel of very distinct, distinguished and insightful speakers today. Uh, and I'll be introducing them in due course. But before doing so, I'd like to say a few words about the idea behind this panel and the two-day webinar, which is focused on the Jerusalem uprising implications and consequences. The Institute for Palestine Studies uh, is a research institute, which is devoted to all aspects of the question of Palestine. We're not a news organization or media outlet, so we try to analyze events with the benefit of hindsight and from a broader perspective sometimes after the rest of the world has moved on to other issues and crises. So we try to avoid getting caught up in news cycles and, and, and we try to apply scholarly analysis to events in Palestine to, underlie, to understand their underlying causes and effects. We also try to use this knowledge in the service of the Palestinian cause and to advocate on behalf of the rights of the Palestinian people. So this online conference will attempt to shed light on the events of last May and analyze their lasting significance. In other words, we're going to try to see things in perspective, understand the background and identify future trends and directions. Now the pundits are constantly telling us that the Palestinian cause has never been in such dire straits. And that may not just be a matter of hyperbole since the situation for the Palestinian people does in fact keep getting worse as time goes on. Just as a reminder for everyone here who I'm sure is aware of the basic situation, we now have over a century of colonization and dispossession of the indigenous people of Palestine by the Zionist movement. We have almost three quarters of a century of denial of the basic right of self-determination to Palestinians by Israel over half a century of the longest ongoing military occupation in the world, three decades of off-on negotiations designed expressly to entrench the occupation and the dispossession of the Palestinian people. And meanwhile, the level of daily suffering is intolerable uh, from mass killings due to aerial bombardment, to restrictions on freedom of movement, to denial of building permits, to cruel and inhumane practices such as forcing people to destroy their own houses so as not to be charged for the cost of demolishing them by the Israeli army. The uprising in the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood of Jerusalem or which began in the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood of Jerusalem last May was I think a, a rare glimmer of hope in this desperate landscape. The uprising was a spontaneous popular response to a process that has been going on for decades as Israeli settlers backed by the Israeli authorities have evicted Palestinian residents from their homes and prevented them from living in their ancestral neighborhoods in Jerusalem, just as they have in many other Palestinian towns and villages. Between May 10th and May 14th of this year, Israel injured at least 1,000 Palestinians who were protesting these unjust and inhumane measures. The protests which began in Sheikh Jarrah soon spread to Al-Aqsa Mosque and Al-Haram Sharif. And of course, there had been provocations the month before in, in that site, in that holy site, uh, that partly precipitated what uh, happened in Jerusalem. Hamas also joined the fight from Gaza, and Israel took the opportunity to unleash a full-fledged assault on the population of Gaza. Now, this was the fifth full-scale war on Gaza in the past 15 years undertaken on various pretexts. Israel attacked Gaza in 2006, 2008 and nine, uh, the end of 2008, beginning of 2009, 2012, 2014, each time leaving scores or hundreds dead 
and thousands wounded. And this time was no exception, with an overwhelmingly civilian casualty toll of some 248 dead and almost 2,000 wounded. Several aspects of the Jerusalem uprising and the Israeli onslaught are worth recalling and dwelling on. Of course, it encapsulated the century-long process of dispossession of the Palestinian people, whereby armed settlers muscle in, taking over homes and lands, creating facts on the ground, which are then consecrated by the Israeli military or security services. It also demonstrated clearly, if proof were needed, the colonialist nature of the Israeli regime, with settlers caught on tape frankly admitting that they were stealing Palestinian property and displacing Palestinians from their homes. But it also had two unusual aspects that I think are worth dwelling on and analyzing. First, the unprecedented level of unity displayed among different groups of Palestinians in Gaza, Jerusalem, Ramallah, Nablus, Bethlehem, as well as in Lid, Akka, Ramli, Tabaria, in other words, in the areas occupied in 1948, and also in the refugee camps and elsewhere in the Palestinian diaspora. Moreover, the general strike that was observed on May 18th in all parts of Palestine was a striking display of pan-Palestinian solidarity. And the second aspect that I wanted to <clears throat> mention, excuse me, was the rare display of global solidarity with the Palestinian cause. From cities as divergent as Boston and Kandahar Jakarta and Paris, including a number of major Arab cities. And I think the second aspect will be the main focus of our panel today. What explains this level of solidarity and how does one build on it to ensure that it's not just a fleeting phenomenon? How does one construct intersectional alliances with international groups like workers groups, women's groups, environmental groups, other indigenous peoples? And how does one situate Palestine squarely within progressive movements around the world? In short, how can these expressions of support be put in the service of liberating Palestine? And equally, how can the Palestinian cause provide support to other liberation struggles? To answer some of these questions, we're very fortunate to be joined today by three inspiring guests. Our first speaker, Professor Noam Chomsky, is the founder of the Modern Science of Linguistics and of cognitive science more broadly, as well as one of the most influential public intellectuals in the world. He's written more than 100 books, his most recent being Requiem for the American Dream, The Ten Principles of Concentration of Wealth and Power. Professor Chomsky is currently Laureate Professor of Linguistics at the University of Arizona, after spending most of his career at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And today, he's going to be addressing the topic global power and international solidarity. So I'm going to hand it over now to Professor Chomsky. Thank you. Well, I quite agree with you on your point that the May uprisings had a substantial, many ways unprecedented uh, influence on international opinion. Uh, which is a matter of extreme significance that's particularly important for the United States, which has had the primary role internationally in maintaining the Israeli policy of the last 50 years, the policy of systematically, steadily creating a greater Israel which will include whatever is of value to Israel in the West Bank, uh, maintaining Gaza as a huge prison camp. Uh, but uh, at the same time in the West Bank, excluding the areas of Palestinian concentra population concentration. So Israel does not want to absorb Nablus. Uh, for example, what they want to do is uh, take over the resources, the usable land, the Jordan Valley, uh, uh, essentially everything livable, confine Palestinians to 
population centers, which are surrounded by Israeli settlements, and for the rest of the area that Israel takes over, uh, confine uh, Palestinian villages to uh, uh, virtually unviable enclaves. There are about 165 now, surrounded by uh, barriers uh, so that people can't get to their lands, uh, uh, cut off from communication and so on. The idea is to make the uh, life so unlivable that uh, they'll either leave or accommodate somehow to a, a utterly subordinate position. Now that's the Greater Israel Project. Uh, huge infrastructure projects uh, link the areas of Israeli settlement now spreading all over the West Bank, link them to Israel. You can uh, wake up in your suburban villa, villa in uh, subsidized suburban villa in Malu Dumim, east of Jerusalem, uh, take a super highway uh, to your job in Tel Aviv, and come back in the evening and not even know that there are Palestinians. It's all very tightly integrated. And in fact, by now, young Israelis are not even aware that the international border exists, barely aware. You don't have any sign of it if you're an Israeli or a visitor. So if I travel there, I can be the same. Well, that's the project of the last 50 years. It's implemented because the United States ranges between toleration and full support. And Europe is too intimidated by US power to take an independent stance. And those are the powerful voices in world affairs. So the fact that the May uprising had a significant impact in the United States is of quite considerable importance. And it's not the first time, it's a series. Uh, you pointed out that uh, there have been attacks on Gaza since 2006. Uh, the, each one has had an impact on US opinion. I've been giving talks on Israel-Palestine for 55 years, I've been writing articles and books during the same time. And it's very striking to see the changes, very striking and very significant for the Palestinian cause. Up until about 15 years ago, if I was giving a talk on Israel-Palestine at a university, even my own university, MIT, I had to have police protection uh, to keep uh, and police insisted on walking me back to my car afterward because of the threat of uh, Zionist terrorism. Uh, there are times when if I was spending a week at a major university giving lectures on philosophy and I had one talk on Israel-Palestine among many others, I had to have police protection the whole time I was on campus walking from a philosophy lecture back to my room on campus. That changed substantially, and it was marked by the attacks on Gaza. Not 2006, that one passed without notice, but 2008, there was a very significant change, huge change. In fact, 2008, was the, um, there was enormous protest in the United States universities elsewhere. And it was the first time that the whole question of police protection disappeared. Meetings were no longer broken up as they had been before, even with Israeli speakers who were critical of the government. I could, if we had time, I could tell you details, but this ended at 2000, in the 2000 when caste led the caste-led attack, which had a major impact. And since then, it's been more of the same. Each attack on Gaza has led to an increase in protest, outrage, finally even reaching the 
mainstream, which tries to keep away from this. So in the after May, for the first time, you found uh, major columnists in the press, New York Times, others, calling for uh, reconsideration of aid to Israel. That's a long step. Also in Congress, that's in a column uh, put in a resolution calling for termination of military aid to Israel. Didn't pass, but had substantial support. It's getting more. It's a couple of days ago, 50 members of Congress uh, issued a strong protest against U.S. policy. Uh, that's the the. Uh, the icing on the cake. The real protest is on the ground. It finally makes its way to media and uh, Congress. Now, this is of extreme importance. What it means is that there are opportunities to change American policy. And that is crucial for the Palestinians. There is no way for Palestinian rights to be realized in any meaningful form unless the U.S. shifts its policy of support, massive support for the Greater Israel Project. As long as that's the case, there won't be any change. If the United States begins to shift its policy, there will be a change. Israel can do what it wants as long as the United States approves. When the United States puts its foot down, Israel has to obey. We've seen that just because of the relations of dependency, this became very clear in the 1970s, a very crucial decade when there were very serious opportunities for total political settlement. UN Security Council uh, debated a resolution calling for a two-state settlement on the international border, internationally recognized border, so-called Green Line, maybe with slight modifications, uh, with guarantees, I'm virtually quoting it, for the right of each state, Israel and Palestine, to exist in peace and security within secure and recognized borders. That was January 1976. It was supported by the major Arab states, by the so-called confrontation states. Egypt, Syria, Jordan all supported it. Uh, that uh, is what afterwards became an overwhelming international consensus. Israel flatly refused even to attend the session. Uh, Prime Minister Rabin stated that there would never be any negotiations with Palestinians. Uh, later, Chaim Herzog, uh, president, uh, declared that the resolution was brought by the PLO, which was, of course, a lie. It was brought by the PLO in order to destroy Israel. That was the Israeli reaction. The US reaction was to veto the resolution. Okay. That set a pattern, I won't run through the history, which has repeated to the present. Uh, so it barely gets reported. Sometimes it is so egregious that it actually makes a report. So the most pro-Israel president prior to Trump was Barack Obama, who even went, went to the extent of vetoing a resolution, February 2011, a resolution which called for implementing official U.S. policy. Official U.S. policy, which is quite meaningless, is to uh, stop expansion of the settlements. Well, that's meaningless. You can expand them in all kinds of ways. Furthermore, the problem is there isn't expansion of the settlements, it's their existence. Here, the UN Security Council voted to support US, meaningless US policy, and Obama vetoed it. That was 
actually egregious enough to get a little attention in the press. But it's typical of what's happened. And what that meant in 1970s was that Israel was making a conscious decision to choose expansion over security. They were going to expand no matter what the effects, even effects on Israeli security. And they could do it as long as the US supported it. If the US stops supporting it, it has to stop. The rest of the world is totally opposed to it, but can't act as long as the United States provides support. Uh, Europe will make some gestures, but they're too intimidated to stand up against the United States. So what happens in the United States is critical and Israel is totally dependent on it. Once they decided to follow this course of expansion, uh, they are reliant on the US for support. We've seen that over and over. Uh, prior to Obama, every president, every single president imposed conditions on Israel to which it was bitterly opposed, but what it had to accept. It was true of Carter, Reagan, both of the Bushes, Clinton, not Obama. Trump, of course, gave everything away and Biden is so far following the same policy. But what it shows is if, it, if the United States puts its foot down, Israel has no choices. That's part of the relation of total dependency, which means that if Israel, US policy shifts, there can be a change in the situation on the ground. Well, can it shift? Yes, I think it can. It's very striking what's happening to US public opinion. You go back about 15, 20 years, uh, Israel was the darling of liberal intellectuals. They loved it. Whatever Israel did was wonderful. Even the most horrible atrocities, which got publicity, like Sabra Shatila massacre, still was followed by uh, sort of saying, well, this is bad, but Israel's the most moral country in history, so they will have to overcome it and go back to their magnificence. And that was pretty true among in liberal America up until about 15 years ago. By then it started to shift. By now, if you take people who identify themselves as Democrats, more support Palestinian rights than support Israeli rights. And critically, that's particularly true among younger people, including younger Jews, I should say. Support for Israel has shifted to the far right. The base for public support for Israel in the United States is now Christian evangelicals who are incidentally bitterly anti-Semitic. Their doctrine is that when Christ returns to earth, uh, all Jews get sent to permanent perdition. Uh, can't be more anti-Semitic than that. Uh, but they support Israeli power for doctrinal reasons supposed to facilitate Christ returning to earth. And that's the evangelical community. The other support for Israel is uh, ultra-nationalist right, which supports violence and terror against undeserving third world people. And crucially, the military security complex, which is very tightly linked to Israel. So, t so tightly linked, it's shocking. We saw this during the attacks on Gaza when uh, they were so se severe that Israel actually ran out of weapons and had to appeal to the United States for replenishing the weapons, which was quite easy because is the United States stores weapons in Israel for potential use for US forces. So it could simply transfer the weapons and stores to Israel. This happened again, incidentally. And after May, uh, Israel had expanded, had expended its supply of uh, precision bombing weapons. So the chief of staff 
Kochav, General Kochav, Kochavi, Aviv Kochavi, came to the United States uh, appealing for replenishing uh, Israeli weapons that were uh, overused during the Gaza attack. Uh, furthermore, uh, one of the most interesting leaks from WikiLeaks was a list of uh, sites around the world that the Pentagon regards as ultra significant. They must be protected under all circumstances. One of them was in Haifa, the Rafael military industries, major military industry produces drones, uh, advanced weapons, uh, security systems and so on. So that has to be protected. That's an American high protection area. Uh, the relations are so close that the Rafael Industries shifted their management to Washington, where the money is. Uh, well, these are all, that's the basis for support. And that gives opportunities. Popular opinion can be suppressed for a long time, but not forever. We've seen that over and over again on issue after issue. And as popular support moves towards recognition of Palestinian rights and opposition to Israeli crimes and atrocities, there is a basis for a genuine, authentic solidarity movement to develop as the kind that has developed in other areas, which can press American policy to change. One crucial part actually is US military aid to Israel. Technically, that's illegal under US law. The reason is that Israel developed nuclear weapons outside the framework of the international agreements. And there are provisions of US law which say that under those conditions, the US has to terminate aid, military aid. Neither political party in the United States is willing to open that door. That's one of the reasons why the United States does not officially recognize that Israel has nuclear weapons. If it officially recognizes them, these issues come open up. That can be pressed, and it's a very significant issue. It has a much broader significance. One of the major threats to world peace and in the Middle East is uh, the issues concerning Iranian nuclear programs. Uh, the United States alone in the world claims that this, aside from Israel, of course, claims that this is the, the greatest threat to world peace. The United States imposing se severe sanctions on, is, on Iran. Uh, it's uh, driving Iran towards closer relations with China and Russia. Uh, which don't observe U.S. Uh, policies as Europe does, opposes them but observes them in fear. Uh, the United States, of course, pulled out of the uh, JCPOA, the Joint Agreement. All of this is seriously raising the threat of very serious conflict, maybe major war, and there's a very simple solution to it, known by everyone. Institute a nuclear weapons-free zone in the Middle East that ends any alleged threat of nuclear weapons. The whole world is in support of it. Arab states have supported it strongly for 25 years. Iran strongly supports it. Global South supports it. Europe supports it. Can't come into effect because the United States vetoes it. Last one was Obama. And they veto it because it would mean that Israeli nuclear weapons would come under inspection. The United States would have to recognize their existence. Here come questions about US aid to Israel. All of this can unravel. Lots at stake, but it requires a major authentic solidarity movement, which will be developing and expanding on the popular support, uh, which uh, is growing, but is not organized, not pressing on these issues. And there are others. The other American laws 
so-called lay law, blocks military aid to any unit overseas that is engaged in systematic human rights violations. Well, the IDF as a top qualifier is constantly engaged in serious human rights violations. Uh, most of them, the ones in Gaza are grotesque enough so that they get reported. But on the West Bank, they're happening every day. Anybody, it's not a secret. Anybody who reads, uh, say, the regular columns of uh, Gidon Levy and Haaretz, every day, practically every day, new severe human rights abuses. Uh, Israeli army goes into a village in uh, Jordan Valley, which is scorching with heat, and destroys all of the solar panels that were sent by an Italian uh, humanitarian group, so they don't have electricity. That was two days ago. Uh, the civil administration comes in and bulldozes a dirt road that lets Jordan Valley villagers go to their crops uh, yesterday. Means the crops wither and die and the village disappears. Uh, soldiers come in and destroy a, a village uh, or maybe a collection of tents. It's virtually daily, but it's below the radar. Doesn't get enough, doesn't get reported in the West, but it's happening and a solidarity group could make this major issues. Well, it goes on, I won't go on, but I think here the general point is, and the May events accelerated this, is that there are increasing opportunities to mobilize US public opinion on the ground in ways which will influence policy and policy, even gestures on the part of the US government are terrifying to Israel because they understand, the leadership understands that their criminal policies of creating greater Israel depend crucially on US support. If that declines, Europe will be fr free to take serious gestures and Israel will have to back away from these policies and move towards a political settlement of one kind or another. Thank you very much. Um, many, many important observations that I hope we'll have a chance to pick up on in the, in the discussion and the question and answer. Um, but now uh, we am also keen to hear from our second speaker, uh, Professor Noura Ayraqat, who is a human rights attorney and an associate professor of law at Rutgers University in, in New Jersey. Her most recent book is Justice for Some, Law and the Question of Palestine, which was published by Stanford University Press in 2019. She's also co-founder of the online magazine Jadalia, an editorial board member at the Journal of Palestine Studies, and a leading voice in support of the Palestinian cause in the news media, especially in the West. And she'll be speaking on the topic, changes on the international scene. Thank you so much, Dr. Kharedi. Thank you, Professor Chomsky for setting the tone and laying out for us the historical and the present context so that we can enter this on a very, uh, on the depth of a long foundation of resistance to Israel's settler colonization and its unfettered support from Western capitals. Um, and I'm honored obviously to be here with my fellow co-founding editor of Jadalia and dear friend, uh, Professor Sinan Antun. Um, I, had, I had a problem thinking about, you know, where to start this conversation. My challenge, we, we were so overwhelmed with recent and ongoing events with the, um, basically the apex of what has been an unprecedented Palestinian uprising in our recent history, possibly the most significant in the past two decades, uh, definitely the most significant in the past two decades, or to begin somewhere even more historical that sets the stage for us to understand this um, in the context similar to what Professor Chomsky has offered us. Um, failing to be able to decide where to start, I've decided instead to start from three starting points instead of one. 
and not in chronological order necessarily. This is somewhat of, of literary license, which I do with tremendous humility in um, the audience of one of the greatest poets uh, that we know, Sinan Antun, again. And so if I can begin um, with one of my three beginnings, the first beginning is this present moment. Um, since the, the cessation of aerial strikes and bombardment against Gaza, also known as ceasefire, which was never the end of settler colonization and never the end of structural violence and racism against Palestinians. All that was ceased in that moment was aerial bombardment against a besieged population who does not have the option, who does not have the option to become refugees as we've seen um, just today as Egypt uh, colludes in Israel's debilitating siege on Gaza and sealed the Rafah border. But since then, what are, the, what are the events that are, are worth mentioning that highlight the ongoing nature of Palestinian resistance as well as the ongoing, frankly, and, uh, incessant uh, Israeli forms of violence and cruelty? Well, just last night, I'll begin with, a personal, with the personal because it's so close to me, the Palestinian Authority detained my dear friend, Fadi Quran. Uh, Fadi is an advocate and is a, a, an organizer with Avaz who is interested in, in change across the Middle East and across the world. He was thrust once again into the forefront when his dear friend, Nizar Benat, was killed by the Palestinian Authority in its custody for its criticism of the Palestinian Authority. The PA has been, has long been, in service of Israel's settler colonization. And now it has it is gone full force and very publicly and very explicitly in that service, not necessarily in service just of Israel, but also in service of itself. What the uprisings demonstrated is that there is an entirely new generation of Palestinian organic leaders who are loosely connected without formal funding, without formal recognition, without central organization, who have been able to bring us to this present moment, again, to wage one of the most significant uprisings of our time, who were able to consolidate Palestinian gains in the past few decades to wage a general strike across fragmented, violent borders that um, separate us, and this, for the Palestinian Authority was seen less as, for example, I saw it, or perhaps others in the, who are in this audience might have seen it, a great moment of hope of a new generation to carry this mantle, to break us from the shackles of the sovereignty trap that also has placed us in. Instead, the Palestinian Authority saw that as a threat to its own power. And so this exercise, the killing of Nizar Benat, the detention of Ubay, the detention of Fadi Quran last night are all in the service of exercising power, demonstrating it uh, and, and, and demonstrating that what is at stake is not necessarily our freedom, but what is at stake is the ability for this particular elite to remain in power, just as they have done historically during the bomb Israeli bombardments on Gaza when they stifled protests in the West Bank for fear that there could too be an uprising against them there. Who else is in detention? Israel has detained since the, since the ceasefire, has detained 2000 Palestinian citizens of the state to quote unquote, settle the score. It's detaining its quote own citizens because they dared to protest even as Jewish Zionist mobs were entering their homes, the places that we consider of greatest sanctuary, were entering their homes with impunity to beat Palestinians, were lynching Palestinians, not just in, in full view of Israeli police, but in full view of Israeli audiences who watched it on television. And these 2,000 Palestinians are now in detention specifically to remind Palestinians there is no such thing as equality within Israel. They do not have the right to protest. 
Their protest, Palestinian protest within Israel is similar to black protest in the United States, is that it's not considered just part of a spectrum of free speech, it is considered insurgency. It is considered rebellion against the state and the foundations upon which it is based. Israel continues this form of massive, massive arrest in order to chill and to intimidate those who the rest might hail as Israel being the only democracy to detain um, its own citizens and is even more cruel to Palestinians who do not have citizenship, as is the case with Leah Nasser, a young Palestinian Birzit student who is in Israeli detention, as is the case with Shaza Ode, who is the head of the Palestinian Health Network, uh, excuse me, Health Organizations Network. The detention of Shaza we should um, emphasize is an attempt for Israel to destabilize those informal networks that are meant to support Palestinian life, even against Israel's attempt to produce Palestinian death, social death. The, the Palestinian health networks are there to supplement a completely um, disemboweled Palestinian health system. And the detention of Shada is where there are no charges against her. She has appeared three times before an Israeli judicial panel, only for the prosecution to ex request extended time because there is no charge against her. The most that they are trying to pin on her is an affiliation with the PFLP in order to assert that any money, therefore, that goes to this health network is money that is support of terrorism similar to the way that the state has, dis, um, has, has disemboweled the um, alternative agricultural networks that have been in place that Palestinians have ingeniously and fastidiously set up in order to create their own systems of food in the face of this colonial subjugation. If that were not cruel enough, we have also witnessed recently when Suha Jarrad, a 31-year-old jurist, a young woman, the daughter of Khaled de Jarrar died from a pre-existing health condition and her mother, Khaleda, an elected Palestinian parliamentarian who is now in detention again without charge or she under administrative detention, but without an actual criminal indictment, which I would put into question anyway in Israel's military kangaroo courts. They refused the humanitarian exception for Khaleda to be released simply to bury her daughter. This is not about security. This is cruelty at its apex in order to remind Palestinians that they will be met with no mercy in order to compel us to surrender, and yet we don't. As stated by Khalida in her letter from prison, she writes, from the depths of my agony, I reached out and embraced the sky of our homeland through the window of my prison cell in Damon prison, Haifa. Worry not, my child, I stand tall and steadfast. Despite the shackles and the jailer, I am a mother in sorrow. From yearning to see you one last time, all I wanted was to bid my daughter a final farewell with a kiss on her forehead and to tell her I love her as much as I love Palestine. My daughter, forgive me for not attending the celebration of your life. Um, a few days ago, the Israeli high court ruled that the Israeli military has the right and the prerogative to detain and maintain the body of my cousin, Ahmed Erika, who will, ever, who will forever be frozen at 27 years old because that is, the, that is the age he was when two Israeli officers shot him six times above the waist in two seconds and then collected his body, declared him a terrorist, and have held his body hostage in a Israeli freezer in association with Tel Aviv University now for over a year. In a split panel, the Israeli high court ruled that the Israeli military has the right to detain him and that body to be exchanged in a body exchange with Hamas. Um, there is no precedent for this. There is no loophole for this. There is nothing. This is nothing but a war crime and an act of cruelty um, to detain Ahmed's body. The split decision, even in the split, even the sole 
um, judge who said that Ahmad's body should not be detained, ruled that it shouldn't be detained, not because of the damning evidence that demonstrates that he was not an assailant, but because simply he wasn't a Hamas member, which reflects in other Israeli judicial decision, which has us which declared that this policy shall not just apply to Hamas members. We saw that just last week, again, in Janine refugee camp, when the uh, Israeli officer, Israeli snipers, shot four Palestinian young men and detained two of the bodies, two of the bodies, again, to be hostage, I want to name them, Amjad Iyad Azmi Hassani and Nur din Abdullah Jarrar are now detained. The same court is the same court that told the Al-Kurd family, who has been at the epicenter of the Palestine, this recent Palestinian Intifada, told the Al-Kurd family that they can stay in their home as a matter of exception for an, and we don't know for how long, it could be a month, it could be three months, it could be three years, but that the home and the land that they live on will belong to the settlers. That was the justice delivered by this court. And of course, we also know that this is all happening in the midst of an ongoing pandemic. It, we also know that Naftali Bennett has unseated Prime Minister Netanyahu and yet the same is the same. There has been no rest in Israel's violence and cruelty, nor has been any rest in Palestinian resistance. The only difference I'll say in these events that I've listed to you, which have happened in the intervening months between the declaration of ceasefire on May 21 and the present, is that less attention has been given to it. That was the first beginning. The second beginning of the story is at the apex of the Intifada which Professor Chomsky and Dr. Khalidi have spoken about, I want to just emphasize a few things. The first, again, is that the generation that was at the heart of this intifada was a new generation, one that displaces an Oslo generation, the same generation that displaced one before them, similar to the generation that led the 1936 Great Revolt that displaced the generation in the Arab High Committee before them. We are a people of youth. We are a revolution led by youth. And here again, because they are fearless and because they know what it's at stake, I want to emphasize this point. It is one, again, of an ongoing resistance to Israeli uh, settler colonization that begins at the epicenter, begins at the threat of forced removal of eight families in Sheikh Jarrah, transfers to Al-Aqsa, triggers retaliation from Hamas, is we unfolds in the pounding of Gaza for 11 days. Um, we saw Zionist mobs in Lid, in Yaffa, attacking Palestinian families in their home. The numbers of the dead and the deceased, I think, fail to capture the scope of what was happening during this time. We saw image after image of children being saved from under the rubble. We saw iconic images of Palestinians coming out from under the rubble with their hands up in peace signs that even under the weight of stone and Israeli airstrikes, the will to resist remained intact. We saw horrible acts, massacres, including um, that resulted in 15 families being erased from population registries in Gaza. 15 families being erased from population registries in Gaza. Among those families is also the family of, of another dear friend, Hussam al-Qulaq, who has never been able to meet his family, who intended to meet his family, when 22 members of his own family, spanning four generations from the age of zero months, from newborns to 90 years old, were killed in, in their three-story home when it was struck with an um, advanced weapons technology. In the midst of this, we saw Palestinians then declare the general strike, which wasn't just any general strike, but amongst the most significant for the economic impact that it had, but most significantly for transcending the fragmentation amongst Palestinians. I think the three most significant things about the recent Intifada were number one, for us, for Palestinians. We are not fragmented despite all Zionist efforts in order to separate us, in order to contain our grievances into some sort of civil rights in, within Israel, some sort of administra administrative and housing rights in Jerusalem, the right to sovereignty in the West Bank and to end the siege in Gaza and the right to return for refugees in the diaspora again became a single one. And Palestinians told us that in the Manifesto of Dignity and Hope when they told us 
that they try to turn us into different society, each living apart, each in its own separate prison. That is how Zionism has sought to control us. That is how they work to fragment our political will and to prevent a united struggle in the face of racist settler colonialism in all of Palestine. It is now time for this tragedy to end. In these days, we write a new chapter, a chapter of a united intifada that seeks our one and only goal, reuniting Palestinian society in all of its different parts, reuniting our political will and our means of struggle to confront Zionism throughout Palestine. But there has been a second um, impact, which is as also discussed by Professor Chomsky for US audiences, especially this marked a narrative shift. We have never seen the situation on the ground it's not significantly changed the facts on the ground, but has significantly changed the narrative in the United States. Polls indicate sympathy for Palestinians. Palestinians have the right to resist. Palestinians have, has, have emerged not merely as threats, but also as victims. This has been unprecedented. And for the world, it was a reminder that the question of Palestine, as long as it spanned now 100 years and as much fatigue as it is induced in an unrecognizable Middle East today in the shadows of this, um, uh, of, of the US's latest blunder in Afghanistan, in the shadow of, of seeing Syria fall apart, of the disembowelment of Iraq, the Iraqi state and Iraqi society, in the shadow of proxy wars in the region that are incessant, yet still we, the world was reminded that Palestine remains at the intersections of struggles against imperialism, settler colonialism, racism, even climate change and feminism. These struggles are global and local as they travel through Palestine and an analysis about Palestinian liberation. Which brings me to the final chapter, which is now the most historical one, and that's the chapter of 1982. At the close of Israel's invasion of Lebanon in 1982, despite all of the atrocities, namely among them as mentioned by Professor Chomsky was the massacre at Sabra and Shatila, US media was incapable of naming a very basic fact. The victimhood of Palestinians and, and the aggressive nature of Israel incapable in the face of these atrocities, even in the shadow of a Kahan commission, the Israeli commission that found Israel guilty for its role in the Sabra and Shatila massacres. We know from renowned Palestinian scholar and public intellectual Edward Said and his essay written in the aftermath of the 82 invasion and permission to narrate that the incapacity of the media to do so was because quote, the idea of a Palestinian homeland would have to be enabled by the prior acceptance of a narrative entailing a homeland. And this has been resisted as strenuously on the imaginative and ideological level as, as it has been politically, end quote. Saeed told us in 1982 that the incapacity of the media to, to tell us the story of Palestinian victimhood, to name Palestinian use of force as resistance, was because of an incapacity, the last lack of a discursive framework to describe a Palestinian homeland and the need to defend it and the right to return to it. And yet what we've seen in the intervening decades and most notably in this last um, intifada was an ability to fill that lacuna. It was, it was the, the relentless efforts of Palestinian fighters, journalists, activists, scholars, archivists, poets, novelists, diplomats, filmmakers, visual artists, and most recently social media influencers, including TikTokers, who have relayed that quote in the words of Shirin Say Ali, the archive of the Palestinian condition to a critical mass of the global audience so that the head of the UN Human Rights Commission, Michelle Bechelet, can not only affirm Israel's right to self-defense, which is we've been reminded of repeatedly in the midst of atrocity, but to say that, quote, Palestinian have rights to the same rights. As little as that is, unfortunately, that is radical. How is it that we've gotten here? What I, I'm gonna end this by saying a few things and say again, that this has been the groundwork to film this, this curse of lacuna has been laid by relentless efforts of activists 
and primarily grassroots activists and workers who are, uh, who are in connection without formal funding and formal organization. And look at this nonetheless, I think some of the most significant work that began to suture and provide a framework for this uh, discourse of Palestinian homeland came in 2014 in the midst of the Ferguson Gaza moment, which I'm happy to discuss at greater length, when we saw um, when we saw transnational solidarity, a renewal of that solidarity come to life and remind us of a shared struggle against imperialism and racism and, and reminding us that colonialism and racism are co-constitutive structures. We saw it also notably during uh, the Trump administration, which laid bare for us all those things that might be hidden by a liberal veneer, but made them very apparent to us in an alliance between the US and Israel. When Richard Spencer, in the midst of the US white supremacist movement to uh, reassert their unfettered authority, found inspiration in Israel, which Richard Spencer described as a model for European sovereignty. Those things made apparent, which have been so difficult to articulate, it was made apparent during the schism within the progressive movement as seen in the Women's March, as we saw a, 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 a liberal feminism hit heads with a radical feminism, a radical feminism that embraced the question of Palestine, that embraced anti-racism, that embraced anti-imperialism, and a liberal feminism that wanted to maintain the struggle, uh, women's rights struggles to the ability to protect their bodies and possibly, I don't wanna be rude about burning bras, but they didn't have a holistic vision of what an intersectional feminism looks like and what liberation for all, and especially those that are least protected looks like. And in the aftermath of all of these victories, we saw a tremendous backlash led by organizations like the Anti-Defamation League who named everything under the sun as anti-Semitic, in my opinion, overshot in their, in their attempts and have actually hurt themselves. We have yet to see how this is going to play out, but we do know for sure that have, there have been significant victories, including the fact that 350 academic departments, program centers, and unions worldwide have endorsed statements in support of Palestinian rights, people who we've never heard from before. We saw 24,000 signatories affirm the rights of Palestinians, the Israeli parliament, excuse me, the Irish parliament declared de facto annexation as a war crime, not waiting for de jure annexation. We saw faculty at Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Brown, Stanford, Georgetown, the CUNY City University of New York, UC Berkeley, UC Davis issue statements as United Educators of San Francisco representing 6,200 teachers and staff became the first teachers union to endorse BDS. We saw also that dock workers in the Italian port of Laverno refused to load Israeli weapons and explosives. These are people taking back power and not leaving it to failed capitals and diplomats to do the work for us as they declared, quote, the port of Laverno will not be an accomplice in the massacre of the Palestinian people, end quote. So here we are where we see all of these trends, an unprecedented shift in US narrative. Palestinians can now be victims. Palestinians are fighting for our homeland. Palestinians have the right to self-defense. And we see the, a Gallup poll tell us that the net sympathy for Israel has declined among both groups of Democrats, liberals, as well as conservatives, while it's increased among conservative as well as moderate Republicans. It has finally become the bipart a bipartisan issue. This is the precipice that we're at and we are back to the present. We are in the face of certain catastrophic climate change, a tattered Middle East impervious as ever to external intervention and the regional proxy wars that follow. But we are also at the, at the precipice of new and unprecedented beginning. Should we have the courage, should we have the courage to, to trust our young leaders? Should we have the courage to take the lead from those who will shepherd this earth after we're gone? to listen to them about what the possible horizons are and things that we might not have ever considered before. That is where we're at. And I'm, and I'm very um, humbled to be a, a part of that moment and witness to it. Thank you. No, thank you very much, Nora. Um, a lot of valuable insights there and, and I 
but now I want to move on to our third uh, speaker, uh, who is Professor Sinan Antoun. Uh, Sinan Antoun is an Iraqi-born poet, novelist, scholar, and translator. He has published two collections of poetry and four novels. His essays and op-eds have appeared in The Guardian, The New York Times, and the LA Review of Books. He's also co-founder and co-editor of the online magazine Jadalia and associate professor at New York University. And Professor Antoun will be speaking on the topic of means of activating the Arab role. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Khalidi. Uh, I am extremely honored to take part in this conference and alongside these distinguished speakers, Professor Chomsky and dear Noura. Um, I was asked to give remarks addressing the impact and consequences of the Jerusalem uprising in the Arab world and means of reactivating the Arab world. There is no doubt to my mind that the uprising marks a significant turning point in so many aspects that were and will be addressed throughout this forum today and tomorrow and amply and eloquently addressed by Professors Chomsky and Noura. Considering uh, Zoom fatigue, which we all suffer from, and our ever decreasing attention span, and that it's been already an hour, uh, my remarks will be quite brief. I will try to show why I think the uprising has recentered Palestine and the struggle of its people against the Zionist colonial project in the Arab imaginary, or at least refocus the attention rekindling solidarity and reviving support in the Arab world. Now, the fact that Palestine and its ongoing struggle had to be recentered and refocused in the Arab world of all places, particularly when global public opinion seems to be shifting and global support intensifying is quite sad, but it's an indication of and an indictment as well of what had transpired in the last three decades, particularly in the aftermath of Oslo. And by the way, yesterday, one of those detained uh, by the Oslo authority was also Zakaria Mohammed, the famous, uh, you know, one of the most important living uh, Palestinian poets and intellectuals, uh, simply for, for demonstrating and protesting and expressing his resistance on, in his writings. The aftermath of Oslo, whose effects were meant to neutralize and paralyze resistance, normalize and institutionalize defeat and the total surrender to, to, to settler colonialism. Peace, in quotes, became a nebulous, almost vacuous term that cloaks and condones the continuation of Israel's project in gobbling up more land and resources displacing and suffocating Palestinian lives and futures. This quote unquote peace obscured and was used as a weapon or was used as a weapon against notions of justice and the right to resist. To appreciate how and the extent to which the uprising may have shifted the tenor of public discourse about Palestine in the Arab world, one needs only to go back to the climate in the few months preceding its outbreak. And remember the overwhelming sense of doom and despair felt by so many, especially following the signing of the so-called Abraham Accords. Um, it was no secret that those Arab regimes which signed the Accords and their neighbors and the other regimes which would follow suit had already had open channels of communication and even cooperation and dealings with Israel. To use the words of Mahmoud Darwish, the mask fell off the mask. These words he wrote in 1982 during the invasion of Beirut to condemn the stance of Arab regimes at the time. And I find this sentence still relevant, of course, because the mask fell off the mask, meaning the mask was already there. The mask had been there throughout the previous century the mask donned by colluding regimes. Nevertheless, the signing of the Abraham Accords and the official normalization was disheartening as they declared 
Uh, and it was the culmination of years of unofficial or semi-official normalization, coupled with intensive media campaigns to prepare the public and shift its opinion in favor of normalization under the guise of peace and ultimately liquidating the Palestinian cause in the hearts and minds of Arab citizens. In the preceding decades, state-owned media outlets in the Gulf and privately owned ones, but ideologically allied and aligned with those regimes had been disseminating a pro-Israeli discourse whose vocabulary and tropes exploit the history of Arab regimes whose declared policies were pro-Palestinian, often suggesting a causal link between these positions and the destruction brought about by those regimes and the violence visited on their citizens. Support of the Palestinian struggle and of Palestinians was discursively linked to failing states and dictatorships and peace with Israel promised economic prosperity. Of course, looking at Jordan and Egypt who had signed peace treaties, one sees how tragicomic this notion is, of course, of economic prosperity being brought about uh, peace agreements with Israel. This discourse also appropriated the tropes and illogic of the war on terror and projected them onto the Palestinian context to delegitimize and demonize the right to resist military occupation, rendering resistance as acts of terrorism. It simultaneously justified Israeli state terrorism and violence against Palestinians as legitimate self-defense. One of the most dangerous aspects of this discourse was to privilege and popularize the Zionist master narrative of Palestinian history and of the Nakba, and to perpetuate falsehood about land sales and so on and so forth. It also adopted Zionist vocabulary and colonial geography, ignoring the plight of Palestinians inside the Green Line and projecting a false image of the apartheid regime that controls their daily lives. This discourse also accepts the occupation and the discursive and material division and fragmentation of Palestine. For example, a few years ago, a famous Saudi novelist tweeted that, quote, it is no use to moan about the Golan Heights in Jerusalem. They are both Israeli, end of quote. Many public figures, intellectuals, and journalists partook in these efforts and parroted and popularized this discourse. They were and still are keen on valorizing Israel and its supposed civilizational achievements and superiority and dehumanizing Palestinians and blaming them for their fate. So much so that a new category of quote Arab Zionist has emerged. There had also been public events and gestures in the field of sports to foreshadow open and official normalization. Israel itself had, in the past decade, mounted its own propaganda campaign in Arabic on social media, targeting Arabs, of course, from Israel in Arabic on Twitter to Israel Speaks Arabic on Facebook with huge followings. IDF spokesman Avishai Adrai's account has 423,000 followers. I checked this morning, I think it was his birthday yesterday, and he was receiving a lot of well wishes from his Arab followers. Uh, these accounts engage a large audience and provide fodder for the aforementioned Arab Zionists. Unsurprisingly, the material they post misrepresent Israel as an oasis of peace, prosperity, and tolerance, focusing in particular on agri-tech and medicine, as well as women's rights and gender representation in the Israeli government. The apartheid system and its daily violence are effaced to promote the image of a peaceful nation that is a beacon onto other nations. I might have focused disproportionately on Israeli and pro-Israeli state-sponsored propaganda campaigns, but this I think is important to highlight the challenges, pressures, and forces arrayed against Arab citizens and activists who think otherwise and who organize and to continue and continue to express their support of Palestinians and to resist and oppose normalization, its logic and consequences. Which brings me to the fierce opposition to the Abraham Accords expressed by such individuals and groups in the Gulf and elsewhere, of course. In the Gulf, this built on collective efforts that had started a few years earlier 
with the establishment of BDS groups and campaigns in the region. In 2017, the Gulf Coalition Against Normalization was founded, which is an umbrella organization that includes BDS groups and individuals from Kuwait, Qatar, and Bahrain. When the uprising broke, and I'm not gonna speak about it because Noura spoke so eloquently about what it means and why it is so important on so many levels. Social media provided unmediated access to the images and voices of these Palestinians on the ground, especially the new generation. Um, raw images and sound bites showing the peaceful resistance of Palestinians defending their homes from yet another chapter of settler colonialism. The sheer injustice and cruelty was on full display. Um, many of the young activists in the Arab world who themselves uh, were in fights and protests against uh, oppressive regimes that they're living under, and I don't say that to equate settler colonialism with these oppressive regimes, but many of these actives, activists and their supporters could identify with a young generation of leaders in Palestine. If most streets are ruled with an iron fist, social media was a space where this massive outpouring of support for Palestine was expressed and where Palestine was at the center again. There are existing structures on the ground and activists who continue to work on sustaining support and solidarity and resisting normalization and its effects. They engage the public and conduct educational campaigns and create spaces for mobilization. These should, of course, and could potentially grow and multiply to increase their influence and expand their reach. But they are operating in societies that are ruled by oppressive regimes that suffocate the freedom of expression and crack down on all forms of opposition and dissent, particularly those that are in support of Palestine. And there are so many examples. Um, outside of the Gulf as well, of course. I think, you know, Rami Shaas, the leader of the BDS movement in Egypt, was put in prison uh, by the Sisi regime for two years now. To speak of the Arab role, quote unquote, one must, of course, stress that there has always been a significant gap when it comes to Palestine between the positions and policies of Arab regimes and ruling elites and classes on the one hand and the sentiments of citizens living under those oppressive regimes. I don't mean to idealize or universalize those sentiments and expressions of solidarity, especially that Palestine has been and continues to be a political commodity as well, to be conveniently and cynically exploited and deployed whenever needed by regimes and political forces to justify various forms of, of discursive and actual violence and to silence and crush opposition. There is a long history of this practice as well, and it continues. Now, as a poet, I have to show my biases and conclude with the words of another poet, one who wrote memorable poems for and about Palestine and whose words mobilized uh, support and urged solidarity. They resurfaced on social media during this last uprising as they usually do during such times alongside those of Darwish, Kanafani and others. And I think the, the point that Noura mentioned about the, the archive and the cultural influence as well is, is very important. Decades ago, the Iraqi poet Mudaffar and Nawab wrote, and I will say those words in Arabic first before I translate them. The, the translation is a compass that does not point to Jerusalem is dubious. Smash it on the heads of those holding it and rely on the heart. For the heart knows no matter how vehement the wicked winds may be. The courage and steadfastness of Palestinians in Jerusalem and elsewhere in historic Palestine, all of it has definitely recentered Palestine in the minds and hearts in the Arab world. The attempt to symbolically liquidate the Palestinian cause by Arab regimes and elites have failed. And there are many Arabs who are holding and holding on to the compass of justice, which points to Palestine still and no matter what. Thank you.
Thank, thank you very much, Sinan, um, and, and thanks to all three of you. Uh, I guess I should give uh, all three of you the opportunity if you want to comment on uh, anything that the others might have said before I start uh, taking questions from the, uh, the audience. There are lots of questions already, uh, but if you have uh, any kind of brief uh, comment or uh, rejoinder, uh, does anyone want to? Okay, well, if, if not, I think um, maybe I'll start um, trying to pose some of the questions that have appeared in the, in the Q&A in the chat. Um, one question that was posed early on, and I think this is directed to Professor Chomsky, um, has to do with U.S. support for Israel. And the question says, uh, with its newfound friends in China and the Arab world, is Israel still dependent upon U.S. support? And I guess the idea is that uh, maybe Israel can now afford to do without uh, the U.S. support in, in uh, implementing its policies. Um, Professor Chomsky, do you want to address that? I think uh, Israel remains almost totally dependent on U.S. support. Uh, the relative passivity of the European Union with regard to Israel is conditioned on U.S. support for Israel. If the U.S. moves towards the general international consensus on this, Europe will no longer be constrained. They will therefore be able to take significant measures to join in the isolation of Israel from the international community as long as it maintains its criminal occupation. Uh, so that's not just a matter of the overwhelming U.S. support, but also of the essentially passive European acceptance of Israel. There's no replacement for this in the world. I mean, uh, Israel can have uh, relations with Bahrain, but uh, that's not going to replace uh, support by Israel and by the United States and Europe. So I think, uh, in fact, if you look at the Abraham Accord agreement, it's kind of interesting. I think it's been somewhat misconceived. It's part of a uh, general geostrategic program, uh, which was brought to the fore by the Trump administration. The Trump administration had the advantage of uh, doing things in such a grotesque fashion that you could see very clearly what the general policies are. More diplomatic administrations managed to conceal them somewhat. But under Trump, it became very visible. The goal was explicitly to create a an international reactionary alliance of the world's most reactionary states uh, run by Washington. Uh, it would include in the Western Hemisphere, uh, Bolsonaro's Brazil kind of neo-fascist government. In the Middle East, in the, to the East, it would include Modi's India. Modi is busy destroying the remnants of Israel, of Indian secular democracy, crushing Muslims. He's a very natural member in, uh, in Europe, a leading member is uh, Hungary, Orban's Hungary, uh, destroying Hungarian democracy, now becoming the darling of the US right. Uh, in the Middle East, it's uh, Al Sisi's Egypt, the most brutal vicious dictatorship in Egypt's history, the family dictatorships of the Gulf, the most reactionary states in the world. Uh, Morocco is brought in for several reasons. One, uh, because it's uh, uh, it, a lot of this alliance is resource-based and Morocco has the world's largest uh, deposits of uh, phosphates, which are critical, irreplaceable for the agricultural production of the world. 
they've now taken over Western Sahara with US support for the first time to increase their near monopoly over phosphates. So the Moroccan dictatorship is a natural member of this. And of course, Israel, which has gone very far to the right and now provides basically the muscle security support, uh, arms and so on. And the, crucially, the entry to support from the United States. But that only works as long as the American elite population is willing to continue support for Israel, uh, as long as public opposition doesn't seep into change of policy. Then you'll find dictators all over the world uh, trying to cozy up to Israel so that Israel will help them uh, in Washington. Uh, that can all decline and disappear. So in general, the role of the United States is critical in many dimensions. And if support for Israeli crimes in the United States declines as it is doing among the population, that can have a major global influence. Thank you very much. There's a question um, about Canada's role, uh, and maybe Professor Chomsky could address this as, as well. In thinking about the role of the US and therefore its general populace, I wonder if Professor Chomsky can comment on Canada's position in Western Israel relations, particularly as we continue to see minority governments, one uh, election after the other, and Canada's new Democratic Party now branding their platform with some of the most progressive views on Palestine, i.e. stop arms sales, oppose settlements, and some have even gone as far as conditional trade economic sanctions. I guess one question is, is that perhaps a precedent? Uh, is it maybe indicating the shape of things to come? Could it have a conceivable accelerating role in the US also on, on discourse and on um, the political establishment. Sorry, I, could you summarize the question? I didn't quite catch it. I guess Canada's role, uh, and especially that uh, the, the new Democratic Party, the NDP in Canada has, has been taking very progressive stances on Palestine. And could this have a precipitating effect on the US or uh, you know, advanced discourse in the West generally? Well, in the West generally, uh, there has been a major shift uh, dramatically in the United States. Uh, take say the leading uh, liberal intellectual journal in the United States by far the New York Review, it's the journal of liberal intellectuals. Uh, very interesting to see what's happened there. You can now read in the New York Review articles which are very critical of the Israeli occupation. They're of course written by Israelis. That way the journal's editors can protect themselves from the charges of uh, you know anti-semitism and so on so the trick is to get israel liberal israelis to write to criticize the occupation and they're doing a good job but notice something i've been following the new york review closely for 60 years uh, 50 years ago i used to be allowed to write in it there was a brief period in the early 70s late 60s when they allowed uh, people from the left to appear in the journal that ended by the mid 70s with the shift to the general shift to the right. But although I was writing in the New York Review, they would never touch anything I said about Israel Palestine. That was too incendiary that they wouldn't allow. Continued in later years. Uh, for example, they would never review a book of mine on Israel Palestine unless they were compelled to because the book was reviewed in England by the British literary journals and then they were embarrassed because 
American intellectuals read it, but then they would write a highly critical review, changed. Now they're publishing in a mild form, but a good form, things that were untouchable uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago. Well, that's a sign of the change of discourse. Of course, they'll never concede it. Nobody does that. But it's very striking to see. And you see the same across the board. It's not just the New York Review. They're a symbol. So yes, discourse is changing, changing in many ways. Take the New York Times. The New York, after the May uh, events in Palestine, the May uprising, the New York Times, act, lead columnists in the New York Times said the unspeakable. They said, we have to think about uh, eliminating military aid to Israel. You could have been hanged for that uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, the New York Times actually got to the point of saying that the ideal solution for the Iran nuclear problem is a nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East. Now, they were careful to add a qualification has to exclude Israel, the one nuclear weapon state. That, they said, is non-negotiable. But nevertheless, even to move toward what the whole world has understood for decades, but is unmentionable in the United States, important step forward. Uh, there, I mentioned the Betsy McCollum, Michigan representative uh, resolution in Congress to ban military aid to Israel, okay? It's a resolution, but it's getting some support. Unthinkable years ago. Uh, even things like physically breaking up meetings. I'll give you one example. Israel Shachak, the leading Israeli human rights activist for many years, an old personal friend, I invited him to give a talk at my university, MIT, uh, in 1995. The talk was invaded by young Jewish Zionist activists. Crackley broke up the talk, uh, uh, attacked him, you know, it, uh, it was disgraceful, uh, impossible now. now you have a talk there, you can't get a hostile question. That's a huge change. Well, this is change in discourse. It can be turned into action. But of course, that requires careful, thoughtful activism directed to the things that can be achieved, not the things that can't be achieved, the things that can be achieved and will be a basis for going on. I should say that just in my own experience, I've worked with uh, national liberation groups all over the world, Latin America, South Asia, Southeast Asia, almost everywhere. Palestinians have been a very difficult case. Uh, my friend Edward Said, Iqbal Ahmed tried very hard to get the PLO to take reasonable positions on developing Palestinian solidarity support. They would not do it, refused. I took part in meetings where they tried. It's been on, it's been the despair of Westerners who wanted to support Palestinian rights. Now we have to be careful not to replicate that. Policies have to be designed so that they are tactically effective, so that they increase support, not so that they divert attention into other directions. There's a lot to say about this, but there is an opportunity now, a definite opportunity to shift discourse, activism and policy, crucially policy, in the United States. It's a real opportunity, it would be a terrible shame to sacrifice it. 
Thank you. Um, maybe in connection with that, there's a question for, uh, for uh, Professor Arakat. What legal avenues can be pursued in order to support the Palestinian cause by young lawyers, possibly such as the laws referred to by Dr. Chomsky, and how can they be pursued or pressure or used to pressure international institutions into accepting uh, uh, to listen to such cases? So I guess what is what are some legal means, some some practical legal avenues for um, initiating uh, some changes? So I think it's really, I, it makes sense to ask me. I, you know, I'm an, um, an attorney by training, but I'm also quite a critic um, of the law and have done my utmost to demonstrate that the law itself is not, uh, is not a reliable tool and can actually, um, can actually be more counterproductive than it can be useful. Um, I, I want to emphasize that it is actually the political movements that shift our reality and that the law can be used in the service of those movements and where we're at. At, cur at our current juncture, we lack a, a strategic consolidated movement that can move us forward. Obviously this sounds odd given the tremendous strides that we've made, but I say that fully aware that the Palestinian official leadership, which has you know, the mantle at the United Nations, which has the ear of various capitals can actually derail any of the political um, uh, uh, um, strategies that we've tried to move forward. Let me give you just a couple of examples. So for example, in the aftermath of what we know is the first large scale assault on the Gaza Strip in 2008, 2009, which I wanna modify, not just, Israel's assaults on Gaza did not just begin in 2006 with the imposition of sanctions and the embargo, but in fact, in April, 2004, when Ariel Sharon announced that there would be a unilateral Israeli disengagement, at which point Israel began to pound the Gaza Strip in order to expand the buff what they know as the buffer zones, basically the perimeter of the Gaza Strip to, uh, to make the population even more densely located within its center as the, as the perimeter became sealed. Right. So, but by 2008, 2009, we, saw, we see the first large scale onslaught, which was tremendously shocking uh, to most people watching. And in its aftermath, one, we saw a resuscitation of the National uh, Students for Justice in Palestine, which were able to build bridges with student activist movements. We saw a spike in support for the boycott divestment sanctions movement. We saw international solidarity like from Turkey and elsewhere, which resulted in the commando seizure of the Mavi Marmara. This was in 2010, but this, it begins a ripple effect of solidarity in a moment when support for Palestinian human rights had reached a critical juncture, one that the Palestinian Authority had the opportunity to grab by its horns in order to wage together with some sort of legal challenge to Israel. They had that opportunity in what's known as the Goldstone Report before the infamous retraction. But the Goldstone Report found very clearly that Israel wasn't just the, 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 the civilian casualties weren't merely collateral damage, but were either targets, that the civilians were targets, or in the best case scenario that it was reckless firing. Now, reckless firing in humanitarian law is also tantamount to war crime, right? And so the fact that Israel has high advanced weapons technology and is recklessly using it in you know, densely populated civilian areas, showing us no more evidence than some sort of really insulting cartoon sketches that made by the Israeli military. Oh, there was a Hamas fighter here, or this was a haven for Hamas rockets without any evidence, right? But this was tantamount, some could call it terrorism. I stay away from this language because of how much it's been um, weaponized basically to not mean the targeting of civilians in order to achieve a political purpose, but in fact, to be associated with a particular identity and a particular form of violence. But in, that, in the aftermath, the Goldstone Report recommended a weapons, um, uh, a weapons review of all weapons that were sent to Israel to be convened in South Africa 
it, it, it said that all third party states had to consider possible sanctions on Israel in any way that it continued to facilitate its military campaigns, which was, I mean, it's one level beneath sanctions, right? And there were a number of other recommendations and the Palestinian Authority itself shelved the report. Now it'll tell you it didn't shelve the report, it just postponed it for consideration in the next session, but it was equivalent to shelving the report because it took the momentum out. I was representing a coalition of Palestinian human rights organizations at the time, and I was told verbatim from uh, national members of the Security Council who had the initiative and the ability to implement some of these recommendations that it was the Palestinian Authority that did not want them to do that. And they cannot act on behalf of Palestinians and Palestinian human rights. They must act on behalf of the Palestinian um, state or the nascent state, right? And this is where we get into this realm of diplomacy and how it encumbers us, especially when those that official leadership are not acting um, in, in our service or in any kind of democratic fashion, right? But here was a moment where the law could have been used in service of political movement, where the Palestinian official leadership pulled the rug out from under it in order to achieve what they thought was going to be an advancement in negotiations because of another carrot the US was dangling in front of it. That's one of many, many examples. The ICC is another site of an example where it's again the Palestinian official leadership, which is which is an impediment. Now the ICC, here I'm gonna make this really short so that we can move on, but even the ICC bid, what, what, what pains me is that so many Palestinians are looking to the ICC bid as a panacea, as a moment of justice. And it, you know, they wanna see Netanyahu on trial. They wanna see these war criminals you know, snatched away. And yet the ICC is the embodiment. It is a political institution and it is caught between a rock and a hard place. If it moves forward with the prosecution of Israel, then it will most likely be maligned and, and lose funding as has been threatened by the United States and certainly already accused by Israel of being anti-Semitic. If it doesn't pursue prosecution of Israel, then it'll be disregarded, discarded by most of the global South, which has come to see it as a tool of the powerful since its inception in 2002, it has only prosecuted African heads of state as well as uh, Serbian Slobodan Milosevic. And so there is consternation that this is a failed project and several members of the African Union have actually left the Rome statute, which brought it to life. Now put the, all that aside and what we know as Palestinian jurists is that the most that the ICC will do, especially in regards to military campaigns, is to be able to interrogate each campaign on its own. It cannot prosecute the entire political system. It cannot interrogate settler colonialism. It cannot think about what the context that preceded this particular legal violation. It will only be able to disaggregate, especially the military incidents, in which case it is much easier to be able to prosecute Hamas members as the ICC surely will, that seems like a lower hanging fruit and much less political impediment than it will to be able to prosecute the Israeli officials. Now for the Palestinian leadership, what is their role here? They have an opportunity. And the opportunity is to ask the ICC not to charge any of these smaller violations, but to charge Israel with the crime against humanity of apartheid. Apartheid, has already been legislated in 1973 as a crime against humanity. The uh, Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination found in 1991 that it wasn't specific to South Africa, but apartheid is a condition that can exist elsewhere. We have Palestinians for decades have demonstrated that it's apartheid regime. Now we have more mainstream organizations like Human Rights Watch, most notably, as well as Beit Salem and others, Israeli organizations that have said it's also apartheid. We are in a moment where the Palestinian leadership, should it want to actually disrupt the system rather than to assuage it, to be in acquiescence with it, right? Has that opportunity, but is not taking um, that opportunity. So to the question of what can we do with the law so much, but only in the service 
of a robust political movement. And unfortunately, the leadership that we have here is, is currently an impediment to that. So short of that, I think the things that we should use the law for as, as, as amazing lawyers at the Center for Constitutional Rights in Palestine Legal and elsewhere is to use it as a defensive mechanism rather than um, more of an assault until we can actually um, you know, consolidate also our, our political movement so that it can be, we can control how the law is used so it doesn't boomerang back at us. Thanks. So um, there's a question, um, I think it's to uh, Professor Antoun about normalization. Um, it says the anti-normalization imperative was an understandable reaction to the phony equation of vastly unequal parties post Oslo and the false belief that a sovereign Palestinian state was being born. Uh, and it certainly applies to the recent Abraham Accords, but it's been extended to reject unofficial private dialogue with Israeli Jews unless they are fully on board with the core principles of Palestinian freedom. So the question is, will the new generation of leaders mentioned by Professor Ayraqat consider directly addressing and interacting with Israeli Jews who do not yet share our vision of a true equal democracy as a way to foster greater co-resistance? Um, maybe Sinan could take that and-, and No, maybe I, I want to defer to Nora because I mean, it's about the leaders that I have my own opinion, but I think Nora is much better place to, to, to speak to that. So please, Nora. Please go first, Sinan. I'm, I'm happy to follow, please, yeah. I mean, look, I, I, <clears throat> there are different positions uh, in terms of how the BDS recommendations are applied. And I don't want to get into that because it's very complicated, but I want to give the person posing the question the benefit of the doubt. Um, I don't know. Uh, I am not in favor of uh, prescribing to young leaders living under settler colonialism as to how to go about conducting the resistance of that system. Uh, so that's the main point. I think we will have to see. But having read and heard these young Palestinian uh, citizens, uh, leaders, uh, who are oftentimes in their protests joined by Israeli citizens, by Jews inside Israel who come to Palestine, to, to Jerusalem to support that. So I don't think this is the issue. And I don't think we should center uh, with, in all honesty, uh, individual Israelis in this discussion. This is about uh, massive violence and dispossession, uh, which has been mentioned by Professor Chomsky and by Noura. Uh, and that is where our focus should be about this ongoing horrendous project of settler colonialism to center the rights of Palestinian individuals. The same discussions in other contexts there is a, a, a common gesture, intentionally or unintentionally, for example, in the United States, to always center the fears and anxieties of white Americans when we are discussing, for example, the rights of blacks and institutional uh, injustice and racism and structural racism. So, um, and Nora, please add something if you want. Uh, thanks, Sinan. I think that. First and foremost, what you say is that we should not dictate how young leaders decide that is the best way forward is absolutely my position too. What I wanna add is just a, a few things. Number one, I personally, as someone invested in this and, and in it in many ways as a participant, um, do wanna affirm that a Palestinian liberation movement um, should include everybody. Palestinians have said over and over again, since 1917, Jews are welcome here, Zionists are not, right? Have made very clear that this is not about um, Jewish belonging to the land, but it's about the assertion of sovereignty and ownership of that land um, at the expense, obviously, what we see continuing at, at the expense of Palestinian belonging and even Palestinian um, indigeneity is put into question when Israel has very clearly rejected everything, even as it claims indigeneity has rejected everything about the region and its aspiration for belonging in Europe, right? When Ben Gurion says very clearly, Israel is only part of the Middle East in geography or part of the Middle East in geography only, right? And yet we have this 
consternation. So I want to say that I do think that we need a movement, right, that is able to do what Mahmoud Mamdani describes for us was done in the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, which is not just for Black liberation, but the liberation of all South Africans. And I do think that we, we do need to be able to offer a future of Palestine that is a better future than Israel has been able to offer for everybody and for everyone's security. Now, there's a tremendous amount of impediments Namely, you know, when I shared these ideas in Palestine with organizers, it's not that they're averse to the idea of coexistence, but there's a, a neck, a, a boot on their neck. Palestinians are having a really hard time just moving around. My cousin had a really, my cousin was killed trying to decorate a rented car for his sister's wedding, right? Um, we have Leanne Nasser who is incarcerated because she was a student activist at Birzit that makes this call somewhat arrogant in this context. And so where do we place responsibility? I think primary, primary responsibility actually belongs at the feet of liberal Zionists in the United States who have blocked all forms of accountability for Israel. Groups like J Street who very clearly advocate for a two-state solution and simultaneously have blocked all forms of accountability within Congress, including conditioning aid until only very recently, who have vehemently opposed BDS, who have weaponized BDS and, and complicitly allowed it to become you know, an accusation of anti-Semitism as 41 out of 50 states are now prosecuting BDS activists. That work, that impediment, has decimated an Israeli left that could have been a partner in the solution. Instead, they have been subsumed in what is now a very reactionary Israel. Polls indicate that Israel is unique in its society because, it, because its youth are more reactionary than their parents. That's not common. In most places, youth are more visionary. They're more liberal, not in Israel. It's the youth who are more reactionary than their parents. So where does this place us in this particular moment? I think it places us in, in not making demands of Palestinians to make those overtures, but of making demands of those who have access to levers of power to actually impose meaningful sanctions that would allow Israelis to understand that there is consequence um, for their behavior and not merely being able to get a pass so that they can do what they want, kill, maim, they kill and cry victim, right? In a moment, and, and, and rightly so, no one has told them otherwise. There's been no accountability. And so I know that during, for example, in May, as Palestinians were being attacked in their home, my comrades, left Israelis, were more scared than the Palestinians for going out because they too would have been uh, beat up. Right, but I would not put that then that onus on Palestinians. I would put it primarily on those who have the access to levers of power to actually hold Israel to account and to to Israel's Israeli society needs pressure. There's no way around that. It must be pressured. Yeah, I am trying to uh, pick and choose among the questions because we we don't have too much time. But um, it's interesting that there seems to be participation from, from all parts of the world. Uh, we're getting questions from Palestine, but also um, there's this interesting question from the Global South. Um, what can citizens of the Global South do to support the Palestinian cause, given that our governments do not possess the level of power and influence in the global sphere that the US, France, UK, etc., have? I'm writing from South Africa and our ANC-led government, in rhetoric at least, wholeheartedly supports the Palestinian cause, but we do not have the power to influence global affairs that say the US does, which makes our activism on this issue appear symbolic at best. So the question is about the role of the global south and the role in particular of activists in the global south in, in changing uh, and, and in contributing to, to the, the Palestinian cause. Um, Professor Chomsky, do you have thoughts? There's a globalization has many facets. One of them facilitated now by the new communication systems. One of them is international 
communication, voices from the global south can be heard elsewhere. We've seen this for a long time. Uh, take the anti-apartheid movement. It was voices from black South Africans that reached the West and the United States and led to the growth of the anti-apartheid movement, which finally compelled South Africa, South African nationalists to accept the settlement. There is a constant interaction, much more so than there used to be because of the internet, because of international travel, because of growing sensibility in the North to issues of race, imperialism, colonial oppression, and so on, far more. Uh, you can see this all over. Take again the United States. Uh, a couple of years ago, the New York Times uh, ran a long uh, project, well publicized, called the 1619 Project. It was the first public recognition of 400 years of vicious, brutal violence and repression which is the basis for a large part of the US economy, which has led, left a terrible legacy today. Okay, finally reached the public a couple of years ago. Of course, it got an immediate a backlash from the right wing, which denounced it and attacked it, and it can't teach it in school and so on. Well, that's fine, brings it to the public. But these are signs of growing increased sensibility. And that goes right back to the question. That includes greater attention to the voices from the global south. Take Nelson Mandela. He's now uh, an icon, a hero in Western circles. He was banned from the United States until 2008 as a terrorist. Uh, the Reagan administration identified him as one of the more notorious terrorists in the world. To be precise, they designated the African National Congress, his group, as one of the more notorious terrorist groups in the world. Well, that was then. Now, he's a hero. Someday, maybe the United States will be able to concede that Cuba played the leading role in the liberation of Africa. So that when Mandela was released to prison, one of his first visits was Havana. Maybe in a century, it'll be possible to recognize that in the United States. Things take time, they take work, but you are chipping away and voices from the global South are much more, have much more resonance in the West than in the United States that's in the past. Not just the voices, but the actions the actions that are taken for liberation have a, an increasing response. Uh, uh, so I think there's plenty of opportunities for activists in the global south, in their own countries, and in the global scene. Thanks. Um, I'm, I think this is a question for Palestine. and. Um, it says there's a lot of debate among young Palestinians from within occupied Palestine <clears throat> around the immense need to dismantle the Palestinian Authority, as it is clearly seen as an arm and leg to facilitate Israel's colonial violence and do a lot of its dirty work. What can Palestinians living in the diaspora create a legitimate movement? What can they do to create a legitimate movement to restructure, if not completely dismantle the PA? knowing that they technically have no say in the matter. So it's a question from outside Palestine, but it has to do with what can Palestinians outside of Palestine do to either dismantle the PA or completely overhaul it so that it's not an impediment to Palestinian liberation. Uh, Noura, do you, do you think you want to take that? No, we don't have a lot of time and I don't want to have this to be the final word, but I will say this. One is I think that um, we spent, we already know the PA is part of the problem, 
it's obvious it's part of the problem. How do you dis, how do you target it though um, in, in this array of, of, of work that is to be done? And I think one of the things I would advise us to do, especially as somebody who is a member of the North American diaspora is to focus on, on, on really building our own infrastructure, right? The PA is going to fall. It has the seeds of its own demise. It is quite limited when its utility runs out. Um, it will expire um, it, or expose itself. It's already exposing itself and becomes part and parcel of the problem in ways that will fracture Palestinian society indefinitely, right? But that that fracturing um, is inevitable anyway. It's happened historically. It will continue to happen. The interests of the elite are distinct in every society. Palestine is not an exception historically or in the present, what we have been doing, I think has been extraordinary, which is creating alternative structures and homes and places where young Palestinians can find a sense of place. Something that the PLO has historically provided for Palestinians in diaspora, which is no longer, and yet in our activist communities, in our cultural spaces, in our film festivals, in our literary festivals, in our youth organizing, in our political organizing, in the SJPs, right? We are creating political homes and places where we're nurturing new leaders who have taken the mantle. I've not been in this as long, obviously, as either of my co-panelists, but in my you know, short time of you know, some two plus decades of doing this work, I've witnessed tremendous change. And in the moments of extreme anxiety where I thought that if I take a step back, what's going to happen? Every time I've taken a step back, whether it's to produce scholarship or otherwise, um, I, there's nothing to worry about. The young did not forget. We have only proliferated um, and, and learned to grow. And so I would advise us in this moment to, to, to look inward, to provide better healing and, 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 and welcoming spaces for our organizers where it's not toxic, where we're not always telling people what they're doing wrong or how their position is not pure, but in, instead having grace so that these, that, that these new generations continue to be embraced and nurtured and so that they can stand on our shoulders to continue this work. Okay, thanks. I, I think that's all the time we have. We have lots of questions. We have maybe another 50 questions that we weren't able to get to. Um, but um, I think you've already given us a great deal to think about and, and many grounds for hope. Although we shouldn't get carried away because there's a lot of work to be done. But I think all three of you have indicated to us, um, to me certainly, to, and to the online audience, I'm sure, various avenues and various um, creative ways in which we can continue to pursue support for, for the cause. And so insights, as well as uh, to thank members of the online audience uh, for, for their attention and for their questions.